What was the topic on the first day of your most recent science class? I bet it was a discussion of the scientific method where we present scientists laboring away, constantly revising our understanding of the world as the data and papers roll in. But is that an accurate view? Okay, okay, what did you learn about on the first day of your last Bible study? Actually, the starting point probably isn't as universal, but I bet at some point you heard that the Bible is God's word and that the biblical canon is fixed and unchanging. So some argue that because science is always changing and the biblical canon is fixed, we shouldn't allow science to influence our understanding of scripture. Actually, neither one of these gives a full account of how scientific or biblical interpretation works. Today, we're gonna to talk about how the scientific revolution initiated by the transformation from geocentrism to heliocentrism, also caused a revolution of our understanding of a few select passages of scripture and our approach to the Bible as a whole. Now we're continuing to give context to one of our recent videos on the discovery of heliocentrism and its influence on biblical interpretation. Now to talk about the influence of astronomy on the Bible, I wanna talk about this guy, Thomas Kuhn influential philosopher and historian of science. His 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which Time Magazine listed as one of the 100 most influential nonfiction books of all time, pointed out that science sometimes works in a normal way where new information leads to new understandings, but in most cases, they don't produce major revisions, just minor tweaks to our theories. For example, COVID-19 has helped scientists and society better understand how populations are vulnerable to different pathogens and more about the epidemiological spread of disease, but it hasn't caused us to revise our core beliefs about germ theory or disease vectors or vaccines. Unless, of course, it turns out that COVID-19 is caused by 5G, in which case I'm going to quit science altogether. Now, in this way, science does work just as it was described on the first day of class constant fine-tuning of understanding. Hooray for science! But other times, discoveries are made that don't fit into our current paradigm. They might cause a crisis that causes some to consider revising our core beliefs. Like, for example, our observations of the retrograde motion of the planets didn't fit nicely into our belief that the Earth was at the center of our universe and led Copernicus and Galileo. Well, you know the story. Kuhn argued, and I agree, that we aren't willing to make those paradigm shifts, yes, he coined that term, lightly. We'll change our core understandings only when forced to, and usually only after a new idea comes along from an innovative thinker that does a better job of making sense of the available information. We talked about this last time. It's called inference to the best explanation. When a new explanation makes better sense of the world, we will begrudgingly change what we believe about how the world works, and that leads to a revolution of science. The adoption of heliocentrism was a revolution of science. The transition from a static view of creation to a dynamic, evolving one, thanks to Charles Darwin, that was a revolution in science. Interestingly, we'll also see that Kuhn's model of dramatic revolutions versus gradual change applies to biblical interpretation as well. And that's not a terrible thing. Well, prior to the shift from geo to heliocentrism produced by our trio of scientists, common sense dictated that the Earth was central in our solar system but it wasn't just common sense that influenced that belief. The Bible contains verses that appear to point to a geocentric solar system, and many people assumed that if it was in the Bible, then it must be accurate. For example, Psalm 93.1 says, He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. In Psalm 104.5, The world is established, it shall never be moved. Whereas Ecclesiastes 5.1 says that the sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises again. Now Joshua 10 is where it gets really interesting. In verses 12 through 14, it says, 
At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ahalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of the heavens and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Now the verses in the Psalms might be dismissed. It's poetic language, and we still say the sun rises and the sun sets the day. I don't totally buy that argument, but I can see how it could put your mind at ease. But the verses in Joshua 10 are more complicated. As biblical genres go, we tend to read historical narratives more literally, and poetry and prophecy less literally. So these verses in Joshua were believed to accurately report on the cessation of the motion of the sun because they are incidental to a historical narrative which appears to provide a simple account of what happened during an unusual day on the field of battle. Here's what Martin Luther reportedly said when he heard about the pending proposal from Copernicus. This is what that fellow does who wishes to turn the whole of astronomy upside down. Even in these things that are thrown into disorder, I believe the Holy Scriptures. For Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the earth. Now, that became problematic when evidence accumulated that the sun is always standing still and that we are rotating around it. So what do we make of these passages? It's evident that the authors of Scripture believed in geocentrism. They certainly used geocentric language in their writing, but does that mean that the Scriptures are teaching geocentrism? If it isn't obvious, we're trying to determine if God corrected the ancient author's misunderstandings about the physical world. If he did, we can expect the scientific references in Scripture to be accurate. Or if God accommodated and allowed the authors to write what they understood, which means we shouldn't read the Bible expecting to find precise scientific explanations. This is arguably the first instance of direct tension between what we can learn from the study of the physical world and what we can deduce from the study of Scripture. As the evidence for heliocentrism became stronger and stronger, it forced us to reconsider those verses. It troubled some that the Bible contains statements that, if read literally, were not true. Even before this debate, there were three approaches to interpreting Scripture. Of course, the literal interpretation, meaning that the meaning should be drawn from a plain understanding of the words, or an allegorical interpretation where meaning is woven into poetry or narrative that's not intended as an accurate historical or scientific teaching, or a combination, that God accommodated the ancient understandings of the authors of Scripture and let them convey the inspired message through the words that we attribute to the author. Now, what's interesting is that these were existing ideas. The heliocentrism debate didn't initiate this conversation. The tension comes in knowing which passages should be interpreted literally, which an allegory, and which should be read through the lens of accommodation. So the heliocentrism debate didn't introduce new methods of biblical interpretation, but it did skew our perspectives to believe that even some historical narratives, which were usually interpreted more literally, could best be understood by interpreting them through the lens of historical beliefs and customs at the time. All right, let's tie up our package. Can we apply Kuhn's view of science to biblical interpretation? I think it is an appropriate analogy, but it isn't a perfect fit. Yes, like science, biblical interpretation is resistant to change, and that is a good thing. We don't want the meaning of scriptural passages to be left to the whimsy of anyone who picks up a Bible. Holding to tradition and biblical exegesis is not that different from the resistance of scientists to changing our paradigms of understanding about the world. In fact, humans in general are not opening to reinterpreting our foundational beliefs without overwhelming evidence pointing to a need to do so. 
much work has gone into showing how our worldviews become entrenched and they don't change overnight. I see that as generally a good thing. It can cause problems when we allow the status quo from coming to better conclusions, but allowing everyone to define their own truth would cause just as many problems. But where does this metaphor fail? The shift in biblical understanding to seeing accommodation in aspects of historical narratives was not as dramatic a shift as was the transition from geocentrism to heliocentrism in scientific understanding. However, it's especially important in the overlap of science and faith. It helps us see that we can hold a high view of scripture without being troubled by the errors of scientific understanding in the pages. The Bible isn't a book of science. We shouldn't read it like one. This will allow science and faith to coexist as partners in dialogue. They're not trying to answer the same questions or use the same methods. We can allow the Bible to be authoritative on theology and science to be authoritative on the physical realities and have constructive dialogue in areas where there's tension between the two. Further, applying Kuhn's views on science to the Bible helps us grasp that we're resistant to change for good reason. He believed that scientists work best when we agree on the basics and debate the fine details. But we also need to be open to change when the evidence requiring it is overwhelming. What this produces over time is refined understanding of science and God's word, and therefore a fuller understanding of God. Uh, lastly, the old view that science is changing but the Bible is fixed doesn't hold up. Rather, the processes that determine the function of nature are fixed, just like the biblical canon. And both scientific and biblical interpretations are constantly being revised. We'll make progress when we stop using science to trump scripture or the other way around and allow Bible scholars to dialogue with scientists to come to our fullest understanding of reality which will lead us to faith in God.